Blessed Sunday, church family. Thank you for gathering once again as one family at home. Or if you are by yourself, thank you for going to your usual spot so that we can come together as one church family and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And as we do that today, I'd like to encourage everyone to quickly open their Bibles and please turn with me to Psalm 145. Beginning in verse 1, it says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. Amen to that. Amen to the psalmist who wrote of what it means to praise God forever and ever. And even as this trying time and somewhat impossible season continues for us, may we find ourselves today still able to praise God because we can certainly do so for He is with us and He is for us and He loves us forever and ever. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you that once again, we can lay our burdens at your feet, cast our cares upon you, be our total selves before you, and even with one another, while we do not see each one face to face in our church family, but we thank you that we can still come to you and praise you. And we thank you that you meet us where we are. And may that an expression, in expression of praise to you, be our way of worshiping you today. We pray all of these in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, we are concluding today our sermon series on the book of Nehemiah, and we'd like to invite you now to read scripture with us. Please turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 13. We will be reading verses 1 to 12 and jumping off to verses 22 to 31. If you are able, please rise and read aloud with us God's word. On that day, they read the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, for they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back these vessels of the house of God with a grain offering, 
and the frankincense. Verse 10, I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites, Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And then verse 22, Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also, remember this also in my favor, O my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair, and I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, you shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus, I cleansed them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. The Lord bless the reading of his word. A good day to all of you, dear friends. We are here today because we are going to close our study of the book of Nehemiah, which you have already seen is about recommitting God's people to God's glory. We have been through this for, I think, almost a year now, and uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful time together. So just look at what God is actually saying to us from the pages of the Old Testament to realize that this is relevant to any age, whether we're referring to generations or to any age group, because that, this is the Word of God. And friends, in this very last chapter, we're going to talk about the deceptive danger of decline. The deceptive danger of decline. And why do we say it's deceptive? Because you don't even know when it starts. So I'm going to begin by holding up for you Something that maybe a lot of you are already familiar because of our present situation. Would you know what this is, friends? You know, you put it on your, usually your index or middle finger. I think you probably guessed it right. This is called a pulse oximeter. What do you need it for? Well, because of the virus raging all around us, the pulse oximeter. Once you start to have symptoms of coughing, fever, or you already are positive for COVID, what do you do? You got to have one of these. Why? Because, friends, the changes in your oxygen saturation, I mean the level of oxygen in your blood, will reflect very early the effect of the virus on your system, sometimes even earlier than a chest x-ray would. So you need this to diagnose very early, how badly are you doing if you are infected with the COVID virus? Why is this important? Because, friends, with this, you will know what are the next steps to do. Now, I was just telling uh, Alex backstage, I, I took my own Otosat, oxygen saturation at the back, and I nearly jumped out of my skin. You know why? Because I saw 66 I said, am I dying of COVID? Then I realized it was upside down. It was 99. 
That's the important part of having a right diagnosis. Pastor, where is this leading to? Friends, we're going through some diagnostic tests today. There are four categories here that you will see. These were the things that God asked Nehemiah to handle on behalf of the people of Israel. And before we do that, I will, I will first of all defer my sermon because before I forget, friends, I have the wonderful, wonderful privilege of relaying on behalf of the Board of Elders. Yesterday, the Board of Elders met. And uh, they interviewed somebody familiar to us, the Reverend Dr. B.J. Sebastian. Most of you call him Pastor B.J. To make the story short, the Board of Elders, friends, unanimously affirmed the entry of Pastor B.J. Sebastian as the new head of the disciple-making ministry. I wanted to make sure you do not miss that. That's why we put it just before the sermon. He is not only a face familiar to all of us, but friends, after his retirement from JD Summit, he will now be working with us as a bivocational pastor, and in essence, almost full-time as the new head of our disciple-making ministry. So before I go back to the sermon, would you please join me? I'm not going to take long. In just a minute or two, a prayer to affirm and welcome Pastor B.J. Sebastian. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to see one of our very own pastors who used to do so many things for GCF get in even deeper, Father, and now head our disciple-making ministry, which oversees evangelism and missions and discipleship and growth groups and equipping all into one, Father. And what a tremendous ministry this is, and what a tremendous privilege that it is Pastor B.J. Sebastian who handled this. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Father, I'm praying that everyone online is just rejoicing in their hearts together with us, with all the pastors, elders, and deacons who have just joyfully welcomed him yesterday. And now may all your people be praying in their hearts and praying for blessing upon blessing on our dear Pastor B.J. Sebastian, because we welcome him today with glad hearts, thanking you for this blessing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor BJ, I know you're listening. So, no more escape. I'm just kidding. He's a good friend. So, beloved, please, let me go back to the message today. Pulse oximeter, diagnostic. In our passage, four. Not one, but four ways that you could look at yourself, and God forbid, maybe even our church. Or if you're listening to me online and you happen to have another church at your church, or maybe your uh, growth group, or your family, or someone you love, look at these things, friends, because they're not everything, but they're very, very important things to look at when someone or a Christian gathering like a church is beginning to decline. You see, the most dangerous time for failure is when it follows after success. This is what happened here in the book of Nehemiah. Do you remember the last time we had a wonderful, grandiose celebration? And my fear actually was when we were looking at the wonderful, grandiose celebration in the book of Nehemiah, we would say, oh, good for them, good for you. We just cannot connect with it. I said, no, let our worship be unaligned with our circumstances. It should be aligned with the reality of God and His character. And I hope we all agree with that because, friends, you could have worship in the midst of whatever you're going through. But that was it. Then, after staying in that place as governor for perhaps 12 years, Nehemiah would then go back to the king that he had served. It was still in power that time, the king of Persia. And he would stay there. Bible scholars tell us about two to eight years. We don't know exactly how long. I tend to lean towards the longer interval, maybe eight years or even more. Why? Because it's so depressing to look at what happened to Israel. I mean, wow. You had such a grand celebration dedicating the wall. But now, look at all these things. Friends, there's a purpose God captured this in the Word of God. 
there is really nothing more draining than to enjoy unprecedented progress only to find out later decline has set in. Beloved, spiritual decline is always gradual. It doesn't really happen instantly. So friends, at any of its earliest signs, and there are four here, again, that I would like to bring out from the passage, what should we do? James 4, 8, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. That's actually the bottom line of our message. If you see in your own heart, if you see in your family, if you see in your growth group, or our church, or your church, any of these, or similar, draw near to God. How, pastor? The same way Nehemiah and Ezra led Israel to draw near to God. Prayer and the Bible. Through the Bible, God speaks to us. Through prayer, we speak back to God. And this is how we draw near to God. So, what are some signs of spiritual decline that you and I must avoid at all costs with all our hearts? So, whether we're talking about a personal or church-wide or maybe small group situation, there are at least four serious dangers to watch out for. In verses 1 to 9, let's look at the first one. And that is a loss of discernment about the enemies of God. A loss of discernment about the enemies of God. Look at uh, Nehemiah 13 verse 1. This is how it begins. On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. What day? Well, it seems to be no special occasion. It seems to be that there was still, at least, some semblance of the regular public reading of the Word of God. Because remember, it started during the revival under Nehemiah and Ezra. So they apparently continued that, and on that day they were reading, and they found out certain things. Compromise had crept in. Compromise. And what is that? Well, it says here, well, there was, it was written in the law of Moses... That no, and then they name certain races. I need to be very clear on this. This is not racial exclusivism. So let me read that. It was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should enter the assembly of God because they hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Pastor? Is the Bible for racial exclusivism? No. You have to reconcile one part of the Bible with another part of it. So let me read another part of the Bible for us to understand. And that is found in Ezra chapter 6 verses 20 to 21. Remember, Ezra, perhaps about 90 years old at this time, was working with Nehemiah. So Ezra chapter 6, 20 to 21. It says, They slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, for the priests, for themselves. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile. Also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the people of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. So friends, when you read here in verse 2, the Ammonites and the Moabites, it was a reference. Now that it's been clarified by a cross-reference to people who remained in paganism. Why? Because Ezra chapter 6 just told us if they will be converting to faith in the God of Israel, they would be welcome. They would celebrate even the Passover. So, this is not racial exclusivism. I'm, I'm just trying to be very careful that nobody misinterprets this part. So it's implied there that these are people who stuck to their paganism. And it's saying, don't join us here for any reason whatsoever if you will not fully follow the God of Israel. But friends, this is just, in, in medicine we call this symptom of the underlying pathology, the underlying problem. And what is that? You see, the proximity of verses 1 to 3, the story of Tobiah in verses 4 to 9, they have a common denominator. What is that? The high priest, whose name was Eliashib. The high priest. Can you imagine that? How do you know that, Pastor? Because that's what the Himayah says in verse 4. Now, before this, Meaning to say, before that time that they read and said, oh, 
popes. We've been welcoming pagans into the assembly. Before that, in verse 4, Eliashib the priest, actually that's the high priest who was related to, the, to Tobiah. Does that sound familiar? Tobiah. I think I heard that somewhere. Yes, you did. Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab were sworn enemies of Israel. They're actually sworn to obliterate Israel. Remember? When they're building the wall, they actually were planning to wipe out Israel. But they could not because God protected Israel and made them miraculously finish the wall in 52 days. That's the same to buy here, I believe. And so it, it's, heart, it's heartbreaking. A man who was the sworn enemy of Israel, you know, who, who never wanted the wall built, after it was built, wormed his way into the heart of the high priest, Eliashib, and was now, guess what, living inside or near the temple of God. That is shocking to say the least. In fact, our Bible says here that he was related to Tobiah, Eliashib. And I believe the reason why there was compromise with pagans and the reason why there was compromise with Tobiah, the common denominator is Eliashib. You know why, beloved? Tobiah was an Ammonite. And not only just an Ammonite, a pagan Ammonite, not a convert to the religion that worshipped the true God. And the common denominator, a compromising high priest. Beloved, once God's people, especially its spiritual leaders, refuse to call out destructive people or behavior, you know, let's not do this. How could we be unloving? Let's just, you know, cover one eye. And allow this false teacher to influence our flock. You know, we should not call them out. Or maybe behavior. It's okay to listen to this Bible-believing, Christ-preaching church in the morning. But in the evening, I listen to this false teacher on YouTube. Anyway, I can discern, beloved, if your elders and pastors will be so passive, so tolerant of these things. Leave this church. This is a bad church. If you have elders and pastors who will not call out false teaching and false teachers or, or tolerate compromise, you're in a bad church. And this is what happened here. Eliashib. The supposed leader, we don't know, maybe by this time, maybe Ezra had passed away or retired or something. Eliashib was the man in charge. Compromise. The sworn enemy of God living inside the temple. And then pagans worshiping in the assembly. That's compromise. Beloved, when compromise is tolerated, decline spreads like the Delta variant of COVID virus until open compromise looks normal. Oh, pastor, come on. This is the 21st century. I know. All the more reason we should call out sin. Oh, pastor, we should just be always positive in our preaching. Most of the time, yes. But if we turn a blind eye or pretend not to notice that some of the flock are feeding on poison territory. If we pretend because we don't want to offend people, then I, or whoever is preaching here, or whoever among our pastors or elders is tolerating compromise, we become Eliashib, beloved. I agree. Positive preaching most of the time. But when called for, call out sin. You know who's the example? His name is Jesus. Let me read for you how Jesus called out the false teachers who were leading people to hell called the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 23. Just a sample. Verse 13, Matthew 23. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
We've never even done that from this pulpit. You've heard us say, do not be tempted by attraction on Christianity. Do not be consumer Christian. Sometimes we've said names. And some of you have actually called me out for saying names. You know, I've not apologized for that. Because there were some of you actually following them, and I hope you stopped. What else? Verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you are like whitewashed tombs. Those are not sound, I mean, soft words, Philip. Whitewashed tombs. What else? Verse 34. 33, you serpents, you brood of vipers. We've never called anyone like that. You know why Jesus was like this? Because people were following them. People were being led straight to hell by their teaching. He called them hypocrites because they wanted to look good on the outside, but inside, they wanted to commit murder on him. They were seeking to entrap every word that he would say. They were... Hanging on to every word in the hope that they could ensnare him and finally say, oh, we got you. Remember, that's his life story, the life story of Christ. And in fact, at his trial, they twisted his words around, beloved. But I hope you get the point. We may feel that purely positive preaching is to be the norm. It is, by the grace of God, going to be the norm. But it cannot be exclusively like that. And I hope you do not blame the church, whether we write it in the shepherd's voice or we preach it from the pulpit. We sometimes call out false teaching or even false teachers. And I hope you do not say, how could you be so unloving? Beloved, we cannot say that of Christ. It doesn't mean he didn't love them. It's just that he loved the people being led to hell even more. And remember, there were Pharisees who repented. One of them was Nicodemus. Another one is the famous Paul, who wrote the famous Galatians. Have you ever read Galatians? Have you ever read Galatians chapter 1? To to look at somebody who dared to call out sin, read Galatians chapter 1. Matthew 23. By speaking the truth in love, we come to a position of strength for where we can extend a hand of forgiveness and grace. But if we out of cowardice or the fear of criticism, we hold back and say, come on, let's not be so hard line, Pastor. We sound unloving and unwelcoming. Beloved, when people are being led to hell, when somebody's about to fall off a cliff, you, you do not say, um, let me analyze what I will say to you. You don't. You just say, you're about to fall off that cliff and die. That is what Eliashib failed to do. Beloved, Proverbs 24, 11 to 12 is something that every spiritual leader should read when he or she is tempted to appear loving instead of really loving the flock who are being led astray. Proverbs 24, 11 to 12, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you will say, O spiritual leader, behold, we did not know this. It's worded in such a way that it's cynical. Behold, we did not know this. Does not he, God who weighs the heart, perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay each man according to his work? What is Proverbs 24, 11, 12 saying, especially to spiritual leaders? Spiritual leaders, don't you ever dare say, I did not know this, because you do. And when you know someone in your growth group, someone in your family, someone among your children, someone in the church, or you are being led astray, don't try to appear loving. Call it out. Don't be in Eliashib. Don't compromise when eternity is at stake. That, beloved, is one sign of decline. It's a loss of discernment about the enemies of God. It's, it's a refusal to call sin a sin. It's a refusal to use words like repentance, return, 
when we should. And that is something that should not happen, whether to a church or to you and me as individuals. Number two, what else do we see here? A lack of love for the servants of God. It isn't just a lack of discernment about the enemies of God. It actually goes to the other end. Here are the enemies of God. You're fine. You're okay. In fact, you can live in the temple. So what did Nehemiah do? He threw him out. In verses 10 to 14, instead of loving the servants of God, they actually stop loving them. They compromise with the enemies of God. They usually are together. Once a church, once an individual begins to love the enemies of God, guess what? Guess what? He will stop loving the servants of God. Sometimes they will even attack the servants of God. So to justify their love for the enemies of God, look at verses 10 to 14. Nehemiah said, I also found out that the portions of the Levites have not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers, he said, each had returned to his field. You know what it means? They abandoned ministry. In fact, the book of Malachi, beloved, was possibly written about this. The book of Malachi is the last book written in the Old Testament, right? That's why even in, your, in our Bibles, is the last book there. But it's possible Nehemiah 13, the last chapter at least, was written after the book of Malachi. So the last chapter in the whole Old Testament may possibly be, at least according to Dr. MacArthur in his commentary, may possibly be the chapter we're studying. And it's all referring to a lack of love for the servants of God. The servants of God, the Levites and the singers, left the ministry. Why? God's people had stopped supporting the ministry. It's, it's that simple. And they had families. They had spouses and children to feed. So when there was no more offering given to the temple, because people no longer loved the servants of God, and thereby indirectly stating they had fallen cold in their love for God, they had to eat. They could not starve to death. They left the ministry. Verse 11, so I confronted the official. Who are these? The, the political leaders and maybe the religious leaders. Maybe Eliashib, the high priest. Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them, who, the Levites referring to them, and the singers, and set them in their station. Then all Judah brought the fight. You see that? Nehemiah reorganized the Levites and singers. You know, their version of the chancel choir. He said, come back here. And when somebody among the people perhaps saw, hey, so-and-so has stopped being a farmer. He's been a farmer for several years now. He's donned back his priestly robes. He's going back to worship. The people, look at, look at what it says in our Bibles. Verse 12, all Judah brought the tithes. They brought the offerings back, beloved. When God's servants are seen as burdens rather than blessings, and the ministry isn't supported sacrificially, you know what happens to God's servants? They will starve. They suffer materially. But you know what's worse? God's people starve spiritually. Remember the famous verse in Malachi chapter 3? Bring the tithes, God said, into my storehouse. This is probably in connection with this. He used the prophetic voice of Malachi to say, you've been neglecting the temple of God. And it's not about God being afraid of being bankrupt. It's God saying, it shows what's in your heart. You've, you've stopped loving the temple. You've stopped loving its servants. It means you've stopped loving me, beloved. And who loses? Everybody. The servant starves. Maybe physically. But worse, God's people starve spiritually. We put our money where our heart is. If my heart and your heart is directed towards God, where will our offerings go? Towards God. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So far, two diagnostic tests. Unlike this pulse oximeter that only measures two parameters. 
oxygen saturation and pulse rate. You had two also, but we have more than two. Again, lack of discernment about the enemies of God. Oh, this false teacher, he's mar much more funny than my pastor. I want to listen to him. He's more entertaining. Lack of discernment about the enemies of God. And number two, loss of lack of love. For the servants of God. And number three, verses 15 to 22. I will dwell a bit here because we didn't read this. A lower priority to the worship of God. What happened here? Verse 15. I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath. What is Nehemiah referring to? He said, the Sabbath day, beloved, I'm going to use another term. Because for some of us, it's a foreign term. Okay, Sabbath, you could use a phrase to describe it. Saturday worship. Okay, so I will read the passage that way. I saw in Judah people treading wine presses during Saturday worship. You see, Sabbath is Saturday. And according to the Ten Commandments, which was enforced at that time, they were supposed to dedicate one day, just one day, out of seven to worship. And then he goes on to say, bring in all kinds of loads. Tyrians also brought in fish. Then verse 17, he might said, then I confronted again the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil you're doing profaning the Sabbath? Did not our God bring all the disaster on us? You know what he did? He brings a history lesson. He's saying, do you remember part of the reason God allowed us to be conquered? by the Babylonians, and then further up north by the Assyrians. Remember why? Because we stopped in our worship of God. We turned to other gods. He's saying to them, you're going back downhill. That's where we came from. That's why God allowed us to be conquered by other nations to discipline us. He's saying, you're doing it again. It, it was probably something that brought Fear the hearts of his listeners, beloved. But a lower priority to the worship of God should always bring fear to our hearts. So what did he do? You know what he's, he did? Nehemiah in verse 19 says, As soon as it began to grow dark before Sabbath, that means on Friday evening, he shut the doors. Why? So that the merchants from other countries, from other areas, perhaps even Jews who refused to live in Jerusalem, could not bring their goods to be sold inside Jerusalem. He shut it out. And then, verse 20, Then the merchants and sellers lodge outside. They, they camp outside the doors. Why? They're hoping maybe we could bribe maybe somebody to open those doors. Or maybe we could slip in when somebody says, Hey, open for me. Or Maybe they were hoping something like that. What did Nehemiah say? It says, sir, I warned them, why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Now, this is not lay hands on you as in healing, you know, what you see on TV. I will lay hands. No, it means I'm going to get the military and police to physically evict you. That's lay hands on you. As enforced by Nehemiah, the strictness concerning Saturday worship in the law of Moses was because the Ten Commandments, the external observance pointed to the state of the heart. We are New Testament people. We no longer legalistically observe Saturday worship. Why? Because, beloved, Jesus made it clear in Mark 2, 7 that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What is the point of Jesus? He's saying whether it's Sunday or another day, we must have one day out of seven that we are telling God, Lord, for six days, it was all about me, my family, my needs, my business, my employment, etc., etc., etc. But just one day out of seven, you want me to show that I listen to the principle of worshiping at least once and set aside that day. I will, Lord. 
And we must show at least one day out of seven that we value the worship of God more than anything else. Beloved, we cannot fool God about that. You and I cannot make a fool of God about our heart. I might be sitting somewhere and my mind is a thousand miles away from worship. I wonder what my Facebook friends are saying about this recent celebrity who went through the scandal or something. Beloved, cannot fool God about our worship. The early Christians in the book of Acts to celebrate the resurrection, they stopped using Saturday worship. They made it Sunday worship so that there's a weekly anniversary of the resurrection. But in a God-pleasing way, over time, the early Christians transferred the applicable principles of the Sabbath or Saturday worship to the Sunday worship, and it was pleasing to God. What are those applicable principles? There must be at least one day out of the week where your highest priority is to honor God. And in that day, you worship together as a family or group of friends. And on that day, you rest in God. Don't do things that tire you out. You rest in God. Even medical science, even atheists and agnostics who do not, will not have anything to do with the Bible will actually say it's been proven by medical science. Human beings need at least one day a week to rest. And beloved... A lower priority to the worship of God manifesting as the refusal to give God at least one day a week as a priority is another sign of a decline. You're listening to me. Thank you. Where is your heart? Where is my heart? Where is your attention? Where is your mind? What is it focused on right now? Is it on the cell phone? I hope it is in the Word of God. I'm not going to take longer, friends, so don't worry. You can go back to that cell phone right after this. But God sees, God knows, when I or you have a lower priority to the worship of God. Number four, and we're done. In verses 23 to 31 that we read, there's a lesser regard for the standards of God. You could replace that with the Word of God. It means the same thing. A lesser regard for the Word of God. Verse 23 to 31, I'll just summarize it because of time. Nehemiah saw that God's people had married into paganism in violation of the law of Moses. I was careful to word that. That's why in your study guide it's worded that way. You see, whenever in the Bible it's mentioned that God's covenant people, in this case, in the Old Testament, it was believing Israel. Whenever it mentioned that they had married, you know, people who were in paganism, it always implies they married into. Not that the pagans had married into God worship, it's always the opposite. They had married into paganism. How do you know that, Pastor? Because even the example that Nehemiah used to rebuke them. The supposed wisest men in the world, who, the, the, so, perhaps exceeded only by Jesus Christ, Solomon. He, he used Solomon as an example. Do you remember Solomon? Supposed to be the wise man, he said. He made such a fatal mistake. His wives led his heart astray. And, and just for reference, in case you're wondering, where is the reference, Pastor, that Israel, believing Israel, was supposed to not marry outside the faith? Uh, uh, Exodus 34, 14 to 16. For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, that's Canaan. And when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you're invited, you eat of that sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. I'm sorry, the ESV uses very strong work because that's faithful to the Hebrew. Hebrew Exodus 34, 14 to 16 is simply saying, 
Don't let your children marry outside the faith. Because it will always have a bad outcome. One more. Eh? I'll not read it in detail. Deuteronomy 7.3 You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or their daughters for your sons. Again, why? Because of what happened here. The children could not even speak anymore the language of Israel. That's how far into paganism they had come. Uh, why do you say that? Because the worship in the temple, of course, was done in the language of Israel. So Nehemiah, in indirect way, is saying this is how bad intermarriage could be. It will reach the point that none of your children worship the true God. And beloved, that's the reason why. We make no apology for saying this. I am not going to comment on what has happened already. Because like it or not, people are already discovering the consequences. I'm referring to our single young people who are considering marriage in the future. I hope our singles will learn from this. It is very, very rare that you will marry and then your partner, let's say, is not a believer in Christ, and they will adopt your faith. It's much more often that you will be more affected than they are. It may not work out that way, then good for you. But there's another problem. It's not just your spouse. It's your children. So where will you go? On a day of worship. No, you must go here. Why? All your aunts. And aunties and, and your grandma and grandpa want you in this other church. No, you must go with us to GCF. Remember? That's a problem. It's not just your spouse. Even if you can win your spouse. So we make no apologies for this. Single people. Even if it's the most good looking person in the office. Don't. Even if she is the prettiest and the brightest and the most intelligent, if he or she does not have your faith, think a thousand times and pray ten thousand times before you marry them. And it goes the same for the parents. So what happened here? Well, Nehemiah, beloved, went to the extent that he even practiced Public physical discipline. Verse 25, I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. He punished them public, physically. Maybe he had them whipped publicly or something. He didn't kill them, by the way. It would have stated that. But it reminds us of Jesus Christ. Remember? In Matthew 21, 12 to 13, Jesus entered the temple. He brought a whip. Not to whip people, probably to drive out the animals there. And he overturned the table. A pastor, how could Jesus be so unloving? Remember what he said. It is written, my father's house shall be a house of prayer. But you made it, he said, into a den of robbers. You made this into a place of commerce, of sales. This is supposed to be a place where people worship God. And so he made no apologies, beloved. And that's Nehemiah. Today, the standards of God are captured in the Bible and its principles apply. Not just to all generations, but to every age group. So when a lesser regard for this one, for the Bible, becomes common, that's also decline. What happens? Doctrinal. Downgrade begins, and where doctrine is corrupted, behavior soon follows. Beloved, doctrine and behavior are inseparable. Doctrine isn't theoretical. Doctrine is very practical. That's what we're learning from Nehemiah. He's actually teaching them, reminding them of doctrine. Teachings of the Bible. This is what the Bible said. You have compromised it. Look at the consequences. Non-worshipping children. I have belabored the point now. Four. Four signs of decline. Not the only ones, but the ones prominent in our passage. A lesser discernment about the enemies of God. Today, it's false teachers. False teaching. Number two. Lack of love for the servants of God. And thereby... 
for the God they serve. Number three, a lower priority on the worship of God. Oh, I will not worship today. I know it's Sunday. I can always review on YouTube or on Facebook page. Why should I worship today? It's a bad sign. I'm not being legalistic. I'm asking myself. I'm asking all of us. What does God see in my heart or your heart? Number four. A lesser regard for the Word of God. For our final thoughts, beloved, let me just reiterate, spiritual decline is always gradual, never overnight, never instant. At any of its earliest signs, James 4.8 will work. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Open the Word of God so He can talk to you. Pray so you can talk to God and ask the Holy Spirit, bring me back, Spirit of God. Bring me back. My heart has grown cold. Bring the fire back in my heart. And let me help you. This is just one way of helping. Every Thursday night at 8 o'clock, we have what they call the GCF Families Hour of Prayer. I'm not saying it's a magic formula for you to rediscover prayer. I'm just saying. If you'll be joining us week after week, you will see many of the prayer requests on one Thursday, next Thursday, they are the thanksgiving. You know what? Just for that, I will keep doing it as long as I live. I lead it personally, by the way. Because I want to see the thanksgiving. Last week, this was the prayer request. I'll give you an example. Last Thursday, I gave my own prayer request. And Pastor BJ was the one who prayed. I said, Lord, I, I said, Pastor. Will you please pray for my GCF assigned driver named Renante? Because he's been waiting for three months to get his vaccination. And we've applied him in three LGUs, not one. For his sake, primarily, and for my sake, secondarily. Will you please pray? And Pastor BJ prayed among 20 or more prayer requests. You know what? The following morning, somebody from GCF calls. I mean, Messages me and said, would you like your driver to be part of our company? It's a private company. We are vaccinating with AstraZeneca, but he has to come within the day. We lost no time. To make the story short, Renante got vaccinated last Friday, about 16 hours after the GCFR prayer. Prayer works, beloved. Join us this Thursday, 8 o'clock. For lasting results, revivals require constant renewal and vigilance. It takes work, but when we pray, God works. And Nehemiah's final words, remember me. They're not just a song in a popular movie. Remember me, friends, are a plea to God. Lord, I appeal to your character, to your faithfulness and mercy. And I affirm my trust in your character. So when he prayed, remember me, he's saying, I'm expressing my faith that you will treat me lovingly and fairly. Beloved, that's Nehemiah's final words. So the book of Nehemiah begins with prayer and closes with prayer. Because prayer was Nehemiah's secret of success. And that secret is ours for the taking. It will make you draw near to God. I have here something. That's called a portable air quality meter. I was li listening to Dr. Tony Dan's lecture about it. And I realized we need one for the home. It measures ventilation. So this is for our home. Because in your home, you better make sure you have good ventilation. So that if COVID is there, it has a lesser chance of infecting you. And I'm going to request our administrator... When we gather on site or before to have some of these, what does this do? It measures the quality of carbon dioxide in parts per million. If it's above 800 for, a, for an air-conditioned system, it's dangerous. It means people are rebreathing a lot of air and maybe the COVID Delta variant. So it should be below 800. 
what, what am I using this for? Again, an indirect measure. It doesn't really measure how many virus particles are floating in the air. It doesn't. It's indirect. But it shows the danger. Beloved, the Word of God today gave you four indirect measures of decline. Listen to the Word of God. Are we still discerning about the enemies of God? Do we love the servants of God? Do we have a high regard, beloved, for the worship of God? Is it the highest priority for us to gather and to keep our minds focused on worship today? Last but not least, do I have the highest respect for the Word of God, the Bible? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in your love for us, you want us to stay faithful. Lord, it's difficult. Everything seems to conspire against us being faithful. We are forced to be caged inside our homes. We know it's for our protection. It makes our worship much more difficult. Thank you, Lord, for technology. Thank you that there is still online worship, which is so important. Lord, we miss seeing each other. We miss the smiles and the faces behind the face shield and mask. We miss the fact that people are singing silently and softly for fear of infecting others when we are gathered on site. But Lord, just to see bodies here, so precious. I miss your people, Lord. We miss each other. We hope in your perfect way and time, Lord, this ECQ will be lifted. And without danger to your people, I pray. I pray they get vaccinated. I pray they double mask and all. Without danger to your people, I hope we can see them back. You know, we love them. We miss them. Father God, protect your people. The internet, social media, YouTube, they're all double-edged swords. Our people could be blessed by them. Our worship is, in fact, there in Facebook and YouTube. But some of our people are being led astray. Protect them, I pray. Lord, protect your people from decline. We ask this in the name of the one who gave his life for them on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.